Less stress, more time, more money. Welcome to the Cash Flow Contractor interview. Welcome, Cash Flow Contractors. Uh, where we're all about less stress, more time, and more money. Uh, today, you have just Martin. We're going to miss Khalil's mellifluous voice. He is in Florida with his wife and taking a few days off. And that's what we're all about. So he's, he's being congruent. He's living what we preach. So, But today we have a, a great guest, Rob Williams, who is the CEO of Iron Gate Entrepreneurial Systems in Memphis, Tennessee, as they say, right? Memphis, Tennessee. <laughs> that's right. Uh, Tennessee, um, Tennessee. Rob is a uh, now. What's what's the uh, the official title? Or certified profit first expert? Uh, yeah, it, uh, mastery certified profit first professional. Some uh, there are about four hundred of us that are. Oh, well, actually, it's more than four hundred now. I think that are certified, and about eighty of us that are mastery certified. Okay, man, that's excellent it, for profit first to be a right. profit first strategist. So. Well, we had Mike McCallowitz yeah. on, uh, Ethan, I don't know, three weeks ago, something like that. And we got a good overview of profit first. Um, but I thought maybe we might, for people who hadn't heard that, uh, well, first, before we do that, Rob, can you tell us a little bit about you? I I've been on your website and you have an interesting background from lumber to aviation and manufacturing. Right. Can you tell us a little bit about your background? Right. Yeah. My background, I grew up in the real estate business, uh, being a, a family business. So for since sixth grade, when he'd send me out to clean the toilets, nobody else would clean, you know? So, <laughs> so that's how we started. And I grew up in the home building business. So we we're a home building business, a land development business. Uh, and then we vertically integrated throughout that, uh, really to control our growth because we would, we could sell the houses. We just couldn't build enough of them. So we started a heat and air company and a plumbing company and the land development company. And then we started a trust wood trust and wall panel manufacturing plant factory, which really got us doubled our volume that year, which it's an, that's another conversation of why we didn't build that many trusses, but, but it really standardized our processes. Wow. Uh, to, we need to, to have you it. on, on a bunch of subjects because we're all about processes and focus. Yeah. And we were doing... processes that was back lean manufacturing and oh, the, yeah. and the Toyota way, all those kind of things were great. And, and aviation too. Cause as we started doing the, uh, trust manufacturing, I started doing jobs further and further away. So we started, we could, I could fly to, uh, I'm a commercial pilot too. So I could fly to Louisiana and then go up to Arkansas to another job and hit Kentucky all in the same wow. day. So what, what are you flying? Uh, I used to fly a Seneca four. It was a okay. six seat twin engine. Sure. Piper. And that's a, and I had the, I had the V tail doctor killer for a yeah. while. The, the, <laughs> that was one of the planes and down to a Cessna. So, uh, well, uh, this has nothing thing. to so do with it. So we really just had one business. Th this has nothing. Yeah, to we do really had one business first. that was vertically, but, uh, yeah. My mother was a wasp. Do you do you know what the wasps were in World War II? The women's auxiliary of service me... pilots, and uh, I've got a picture on the wall oh, over wow, here. Yeah, and she flew P fifty ones, P forties, P forty sevens, P thirty eights, and P thirty nines. And uh, oh, it was, that's it amazing. Was awesome. Yeah, yeah. Back anyway. That's oh, that's, that's irrelevant. But uh, flying's in my blood as well. I, I'm a pilot, but I don't fly now. But. Great. I'm actually in that boat right now. I haven't been flying lately either. I, I, well, well, when I joined, became a professional pilot and did all these things for a living, it kind of took the fun out of it. So. Right. Well, my issue with flying was, um, I wasn't inter instrument rated. So if you fly somewhere and you get socked in, you got to take commercial home, then you got to find a time to fly back out there and get your airplane. And so it was basically a way right. to get the company to pay for your flying. So. <laughs> exactly. That was the nice thing about doing it for work. We had the radar in there and we had the boots, ice boots and the oxygen and that oh, wasn't yeah. pressurized, but I could get up to 19,000 and get over it. And yeah. So that was, that was great. But you had the stuff to handle the ice and all that. So, right, right. So we had the ice and yeah, uh, nowadays, um, 
since I haven't flown for a while, but I have friends who do, they've got radar on an iPad. <laughs> right. So they, they're, that, they're downloading from the, they don't too. have radar on their plane, but they're looking in front because it's, I just going, holy cow. When I learned to fly, we literally used the compass and the high tech was a VOR, right. you know, there was no glass panel stuff. So That's right. When I started too, I started in the early nineties, right before GPSs came out. So I, I, I got to do it the old fashioned way yeah. with the VORs for a yep. few years first also. So that was fun. Well, I'm sure that our audience would like to hear us talk about flying a little bit more, <laughs> <laughs> but, right. but could you give us uh, a little bit more about your background? I mean, why uh, you went through this and now you're a, yeah, uh, we, we did that. I guess my, a lot of my background, we sold our home building business in 2001. Actually, I guess I'd say 1999 through 2001. It took a few years to go through that process. And through that, we started other businesses and they didn't want all the businesses. So we still had our land development company and we built the trust company in order to do that. So that got us from 350 houses a year to about 700 something wow, houses 350 that first houses. year. Yeah. But that's, that's all we were stuck there before components. And it was really not the components because I only built maybe a couple of hundred houses of components. It was the standardization we, that we found that our slabs were not the right size, but nobody said anything. We had no idea. The slab guy didn't know he was four to 12 inches off on a regular basis uh -huh. until we started shipping panels out and they didn't fit. So then we started measuring the slab every time we got those things down. And really from that, we really got ramped up. It wasn't actually the components. I don't think most people that even worked with us knew that it was really the process and the standardization because we started drawing in our CAD system. We did have that back then. So we draw a separate plan for the slab and we draw a separate plan for the plumber. So he wouldn't have to measure those things out and we wouldn't even let him measure it. We wouldn't give him the wall dimension. So he had to put it where exactly we said the plumbing said. was to go. Right. Right. And that you can make the cabinets beforehand. You could do all these things. You know, I think we do need to get you back on to uh, talk about implementing processes in. Uh, oh, that's it, right. This is profit first. <laughs> yeah, this this is profit. This is profit first. Um, <laughs> but how did you uh, wind? Well, first of all, do you have any cash flow problems? <laughs> oh yeah, we had two thousand nine. <laughs> even though we had sold it, that that just devastated us because the company that bought us went broke, and they still they owed went you money up first up and. Yeah, they still owed us a lot of money, right. so that we didn't get. Uh, so we have felt the repercussions of that dramatically, and actually Dad died that year as well. So that really got us into the trusts and all the financial aspects of it. So I'd always been the business side of it more than the field guys. I, I could do the spreadsheet a lot better than I could cut a miter joint. So right. <laughs> I stayed in the office a, a lot and, and tried to develop the processes. So I, I have an MBA like you do. And so that process, I saw myself as a business person before I, I saw myself as a construction person. You know, this is a, this is a great point. Just to one of the things we emphasize throughout the uh, cash flow contractor podcast and, and in my coaching and everything we do is that there are four areas of business. They're guiding the business with, you know, setting a vision and culture and goals. And where are we going? There's getting the business, which is marketing and sales. There's doing the business, which is production. And then there's administration of the business, which is everything. I tell people it's everything you never heard of when you started your business. <laughs> We're kind of talking about right. production here. But in the profit first, I put that a little bit in administration because financials and bookkeeping and cash flow management tends to fall under administration. It affects everything. But profit first right. and cash flow are one of the principal things that they're like the blood circulating. You know, if cash is blood, you, you can have all the muscles and do all the things you want. But if you can't get blood to it in the form of cash, you're you're dead. Right. So. That's right. <laughs> what, uh, how did you, how'd you wind up starting, uh, entrepreneur or Iron Gate entrepreneurial systems? Well, I, as I left construction, I, I had an aviation company for four or five years. And then I really wanted to learn 
more. We, we was in China and I, we were selling to the Chinese airlines and I got, got some international experience there with a Chinese man that was in the scaffolding business. So that was an, so we still kind of had a, an aviation slash well, construction they, they both, background together. They both get and keep you off the ground, right? So they go together. Aviation and scaffolding. <laughs> they sure do. <laughs> Right. And hopefully they keep us off there and without dropping us. So the finance thing, the mess with that we had out of that got me even more interested in how I can help people to not go through what we went through as our family and and ourself, because the business part, I like that. But what were these mysteries of that were different than what we learned in school? the the sequence of return risk the when the, when things go down they don't it doesn't equal the ups you know the ups and the downs so i i looked at the statistics and thought that okay everything's going to come out even but it doesn't you've got to be a lot more steady because the downs take a larger percent out of your cut than the ups so right. if you average something the ups and the downs, you're not going to be level. You're going to be down. So we, we always had big clumps, especially in the development business. We didn't have steady cash flows. We had, it might be two years without a cash flow. And so trying to understand how this works and all of the mystery of these financial HR things that would come in, it's just a big black box that I didn't understand. So I spent a lot of time to working on those. And I had been in Vistage and I had been a follower of, um, Vern Harnish and in the Rockefeller habits at the time. Now it's scaling up. And then an EOS, I'd used EOS for a couple of decades almost, um, with, with the strategic coach group. And I actually became an EOS implementer for a while. That's uh, entrepreneur operating system, entrepreneurial operating system. Right. Right. So I guess, yeah, I've got some of those books back over my right, shoulder. I've seen so I started Jones off with that. Yeah. He's got to fix his next and profit first and a whole bunch of his other books, uh, alongside traction and Rockefeller habits. But, um, the, they were missing a financial part. And I had a client that was a contractor that his cash flow was like what I was describing and it was up and down and up and down. He had a tax problem and cash flow problem, hadn't reserved those taxes. And I started asking some of the Vistage coaches, well, what, what are y'all using? And I looked at a lot of, a lot of these Dave Ramsey, like cash flow systems, but they're not really for businesses. And he said, well, profit first would be a great place to go. I'd never heard of it. And I found the Profit First for Contractors book first, and then I got to Mike's. And, and I think that was probably, he, he, Sean may not agree with me, but I, I think his is more deve- um, targeted to residential, at least it was in the beginning, residential contractors, where I was looking more for commercial solutions. So then I came to Profit First, and we set up those accounts, and I started using Profit First myself for a couple of years, but I didn't do it right though. I did it, my version of profit first. Uh, So I I can't identify because I know how to do it wrong. So (laughs) a wrong is not the right word, but Uh, not differently, the typical way, differently, differently. Well, Uh, so I so evolved in that and that, that brought me more towards um, getting finally the certification. I didn't even plan to use this outwardly. I just thought it was a nice budgeting system. I didn't realize there was so much behind it. So as soon as I got certified, then I went on immediate, as soon as they would let me, they have some kind of time requirements. I don't know what, what they are. You have to be certified before you become mastery and then mastery. They really teach you how it's not as much with the numbers, but they teach you how to deal with the client more than the system. How do, how do you implement it? That's the main difference I see in the mastery members on, on, is how you coach it, not just use it. Well, that's and, uh, perfect so, because so that's I, I, what I want to uh, make sure that we get to today. And if we don't do that, then I've failed to ask the right questions. <laughs> okay. 
but what, good, good, good for for our listeners. So, so that's what I did, just to to help my clients, and 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 then I found out there were the advanced profit first strategies that are not in the book, which everybody can have different ones. Uh, but that's where it really started getting to be valuable. It wasn't just a budgeting tool; it was a a whole system of different ideas and and a coaching group that we can get feedback from all these other members on our pages. I mean, every day we're in there talking to each other. Hey, I've got this guy and he is doing this. Has anybody dealt with maybe a doctor, you know, that has this situation? And so we're always uh, sharing information with each other and well, solutions. To to kind of give a solid foundation to people who might not have heard our prior broadcast, what, what the heck is Profit First? Yeah, profit first. <laughs> Thanks, because I just listened to Mike's interview of him explaining it. So uh, <laughs> if they haven't heard that, we'll go back. It's a cash management system, and it's a behaviorally based cash management cash management system. It's not an accounting system, and that's the first thing. It it almost can be. Um, let, yeah, let me talk more about what it is. It's a an envelope system using your bank accounts for your business. So think of it as a dashboard for your money. It is not your accounting system. So don't drop your accounting system. Yeah, I'm, I'm big on that. It. <laughs> yeah. It, it's a great dashboard, but if you want to, to, to figure out where you are, but if you want to figure out and plan where you're going to be going with that, get your financials right. We have a lot of the coaches in our system that are not, CPAs, like I'm not a CPA, they will look at the financials and they'll say, you got to go back and get numbers. You got to get your book straight before I'm going to take you as a client because you're not ready. Now, there are other people that are not. Um, I, I like the story of when I had, hired a framer for my framing company, I had about 14 framing crews that we were putting up the panels and trusses. And I remember the guy I hired, he said, well, I put my money in my left pocket and I take it out of my right pocket. That's how I know what I got. And I was like, well, that's, that's a good system. And it was, it actually worked for him when he was working for us as a home builder because he got paid every Friday and he paid those guys out. It was in and out. And he, he really had a simple business that Predictable. didn't need to know anything until we got bigger. We started doing government jobs and jobs that would take a long time and you need an accrual based accounting system to have any idea where you are. So you don't go buy that big pickup truck or that crane or right. something. And then the next month you're out of business because you don't have the money to pay your bills. Yeah. Uh, so I I'm frequently say need. the majority of businesses and I've worked with about 400 now, more than 400 the majority of businesses don't know if they made money last month or last quarter or last year. They, right. they don't even know that right uh, and cash is a separate problem but right it's it's more uh, more urgent but you you need to make money and you need a good solid accounting system bookkeeping system to know that but that doesn't get you out of the woods from the right. cash i've standpoint. just been reading your book oh thank you right i just read your book which i loved your book it was great so I, i'm actually really financially focused now because I just finished your book, but I guess I need to get back into the profit first mindset for this episode um, where you, you, you really can slip into not doing your financials. And I've heard a lot of people say, well, gosh, my books are a year behind now because I've been doing profit first, but you really shouldn't have, you shouldn't do that. Uh, it's, you know where you are if you design your checking accounts to be a really good dashboard for what it is, but you still need the books behind it. Um, but the, you can, I, I'm going to lose people here. So let me back up. <laughs> you, the, I remember people haven't heard the profit first system. So do you want me to start back and start over a little bit? With well, no, I, I'm, I appreciate the plug for uh, bookkeeping and let's just, you don't, you don't know where you stand if you don't do that. And you can't make good decisions if you don't know where you're starting from. So Yes. Then back to, to profit first and cash management, cash yeah. and, and profit are related, but they are far from the same thing. Right. And so, right. There, there's a, there's a cash profit. Mike defines profit and profit first does more as the cash that you keep, not the book profit in your assets right. that you may be building as a, 
something on paper, and it may be, you know, in terms of a building, but when it says profit first, that is the money that you as a business owner take home or you, or, or accumulate in your business. That's the profit. It's not the IRS definition of profit. Right. It's the good old boy. I've got money in my pocket to buy food and put things on my table and fund my retirement and do these kind of things that I take home. Uh, and not what I did being an NBA guy, I had my spreadsheets all rolled out and all these profits and, and our home building business, we had loans that mimicked our cash flow. So we didn't pay attention to the cash flow statements because it just mirrored so much because we made it up in the bank loans. When I got into the factory and the inventories, oh, oh boy, I needed a cash flow statement. <laughs> right. Well, I can so I, I can promise I got you a crash course on it. That very few people uh, understand or can read a cash flow statement. Very few have even heard of it. But it's that statement that's regularly produced from good books that tells you precisely where your cash is. Um, but my something you said about Mike is is behaviorally based. And I think I heard him say either yes. on our interview or maybe I read it, but he said, don't fight your natural instincts, harness them. And that's part of what he's trying to do. You have a video on your website where you talk about the first two chapters um, and what they, yeah, that that's probably a, as good an introduction as anything to the concept. If you're yeah. thinking about chapter it one is. and chapter so two or section one, section two, maybe. Right. Yeah. In this book, the first couple of chapters really summarize the book and what it's about. And then you start over again and you go the detail if you're reading the book. So you can get the concept from the first couple of chapters. I can't remember how many chapters it is in the beginning, but uh, you can download those on the web, the Profit First website or irongateess.com. And, and we'll get your website in the show notes here. People can yeah, go great, there and, great, and great. download it. So, so why does it work? I guess that's sort of what it talks about. It talks about two things. How is it structured? So I keep getting sidetracked about all these other exciting things. But the, the way it's structured is you open up a core set of accounts. You have your revenue go in one account, and then you don't spend anything out of that account. Then for, since we're talking about contractors, that opens up two other things. Typically, you'll want to put your materials and your subs uh, as a percent if you can do that you might need a spreadsheet there's different ways in advanced profit first of how much you're going to put in those we won't get into the detail yet on that but then after that's on there then you have what we call real revenue and that's how much you have to operate your business after the subs and the materials are, are paid and so from that money that's what all of our uh, benchmarks are based on. And so these percents, you're going to put money first to your profit that pays the company profit. That's not your take home pay, but you put that there, you put your taxes away as a percentage uh, with it. You estimate from your tax returns and your accountant can help you get those numbers. Uh, then you have your owner's pay. That's the account that you pay yourself from. And that's not and your you salary have, for being an owner. That's that's available for distributions. It's not your salary right. for working in the business. It's it's a distribution for owning the business. Well, that's actually your profit. Well, yeah. Let me come back to that. Then okay. you have your operating okay. expense after that. the The owner's pay is the normal things that you have from that, and that can be for what you are working in the business. And there's different ways, there are different ways to interpret that. So if your profit first professional tells you something a little bit different, that might fit your organization. I'm not saying they're wrong. So the, uh, the typically that's where you would pay your health insurance and um, your, your salary. If you're doing that, then your profit that you had divide divided up in the beginning quarterly, you look at that and then you can pay your, self the owner pay out of that so that's really where it goes now you split that profit up quarterly to it may be going to debt in the beginning and then when you get advanced and you always want to keep a little bit out to reward yourself at the at the quarterly uh uh 
allocations, distributions, and you divide that, let's just say you divide it in half. That's sort of the standard book way. Half of it may go to you as the owner in addition to the pay. So that's the reward you get for owning the business. And half of it, it, it goes into your vault. And you may need to purchase equipment. You may do something, and you may decide to split that up. If you have employees, that may be where you're determining your bonuses come from. So that when you get into the advanced profit first strategies, you really work this out, and then you look at your books and help you decide that. <laughs> right. <you know? laughs> so what I'm hearing, just be clear, all the money that you, comes into the company goes into an income account. And then on a right. regular basis – which can be different intervals. You distribute you have a rhythm to a rhythm. Yeah. That's an important concept that there's a regular rhythm mm -hmm. to this. You distribute it to accounts, operating account, profit account, um, tax account. Um, I can't, you can have lots of different accounts. Yeah. The, you uh, distribute yeah profit. Oh. Yeah. But yeah, the, the, the idea being first, that, <laughs> I, the idea being, I think uh, he says it in his book, is that you can do what you naturally do, which is log into your bank app and see how much money you have. And these five accounts will show up and you can look and see how your operating is doing, how your tax account's doing without having to consider things. You have to consider them, but not at that time, but such as accounts receivable, increase in inventory, accounts payable, your debt, things like that. It gives you the cash. This is where you stand if you had to act today with cash. Right. Yeah. And where that comes in. So now that you get this divided up, so why, why are you even doing this? Uh, because, well, we divide them up first because whatever comes first gets the attention. So that profit, it's just like the 401k, you know, you put that profit away first and then out of sight, out of mind, you actually transfer it to another bank. So you don't even see it. And it's amazing that that actually works. Even on me, I do this every day. I know it's there logically, but psychologically, I am busting my butt to figure out how to work this account because I see this money and I'm I'm working on my bills. Actually, this was my I'm I'm first and twentieth in my business. So before this call this morning, I was doing my allocations. That's your and distributions was, are on the first and the twentieth of the month. Is that it's usually saying? twice a month, and, and I do it that way because most of my income comes in between the 15th and the 20th. So usually I've got it, and then most of my bills are due on the 1st. So it doesn't have to be the 10th and 25th. Actually, most businesses are not 10th and 25th. You really typically want to align your rhythm with your income is what I've seen typically because you want to get that money from your income to your operations as soon as possible so you don't cheat. Right. <laughs> if you if you do it, if you if you have the distribution day the day before your money is coming in, well, you're going to want to cheat because you've already you just paid your bills and it, it just doesn't match your business. Right. Well, and that money's sitting there, and you want to go use it. Do you, when when you're dealing with when you're introducing the concept of profit first to new clients, what kind of pushback or what kind of difficulties do you encounter? frequently. Well, I can speak from myself because it was a couple of years to convert me really to do it because originally it was just a budgeting item and I was missing the psychology of it and, and I was putting it in spreadsheets. And since I'm a numbers guy, I, I was overthinking it and over working it. I had this crazy complicated spreadsheet <laughs> It's a simple system, so oh. don't turn it into your accounting system. I have a lot of clients on Profit First, but one we started, uh, this is the second month, and I got a text last night. This allocation is driving me crazy. And so I will speak with her later in the week, uh, Thursday or Friday, but I say, stop it. Just don't. We, we started, so we, we didn't start with the 1%. Well, Rather than me saying how we started, how would you start somebody? Do you, uh, there are the two kinds of allocations, Simple. current allocation yeah. and target allocations. Can you talk about the allocation percentages a little bit and then how you yes, start the, someone? 
Yes. Start the way I say to start. Don't start the way I started. So, so I can speak from experience. Of course, when I started it, I was, I didn't have a coach. I had a book and I just worked through it. And I thought it was like a sales goal. You know, you want to set those sales goals high so you can try to achieve it. That might be fine on your future allocations, but start, put the bar low so you've established the rules easy. I think the first step, and that's how I did with that first contractor, is we just opened one account and we put 1%. Actually, we did put a little bit more than 1%. We put his tax estimate. But that's you just get used to putting that 1% and you don't notice that it's there. If you, if you set your bar aggressively, then you're going to be taking money out. Right. So right. What, what happened to me is when I would sit down for these allocations on the 1st and the 20th, I didn't even have my dates at the time, uh, but I was looking at these things and I started thinking about it before I made those allocations. And I would think, well, I'm going to be, once I put this here, it's going to be too much. So let me go ahead and change this. And let me, so I had this thought process before I would do it. And then the allocations didn't match and I had too much here and I had to transfer. It was a lot of work. <clears throat> so <clears throat> what I have come up with now, set the bar low, start, don't do all your accounts. Um, maybe just start the profit and maybe you haven't tax is probably the second one and don't fully fund it yet. Start stepping it up. Uh, I, I hate to say that about tax because if you can fully fund your tax, that would be nice, but slowly step that bar up so you don't notice that you're missing that money because my expenses came down over time by about 50 percent over you know a year uh it, dramatically i was just too aggressive i was too optimistic about my revenue and and i had all these expenses because i had a spreadsheet that projected four years out and profit first is about making money this year it's right. not about a dot-com craze so um one advice that I recently have have decided that's the way I want to make get my clients to do it and myself is don't think. The first thing before I start paying the bills, do everything is do the allocations. Maybe don't even do a spreadsheet or anything. Just have a calculator. I did one when I was out of town somewhere. I did it in a car from my phone. Right. <laughs> and I just did the allocations. I did a little trick. I put the, in the name of the account, I put the percentages in. So I didn't have to have my spreadsheet or anything. I just had my phone calculator and I did those and, and I rounded them off. They don't, this isn't an accounting system. You right. don't have to get it to the penny, but do those first. And then the psychology starts coming around. So, so make those allocations in, five minutes is too long. I mean, it's two minutes you right. know, to do those allocations with whatever profits in there. And then the whole process, I found myself going through a completely different process of how, what, what I'm going to do on saving money and do my bills. It changed the psychology, the behavior, because it's a behaviorally based cash management system. And, and I solved these problems differently once those allocations were done than I was when I was working this all out in my mind when I was too smart for the system. So don't be too smart for the system. I, mean, that, I think that's a key takeaway. Don't overthink this. Uh, and the yeah. great, before I came across Profit First, it's one of the routine things I do with all my clients is set up an account and put 1% in it and put it in another bank so and preferably without electronic uh the ability to electronically right. withdraw it so you can go get the money and you can write a check or go physically get it if you need to so you have the benefit of having some cash there and the calm that comes from knowing that you're not going to die if you can't make payroll yeah but it's it's annoying to go get it and i have a client happens to be in memphis tennessee that we started yeah, out at the one percent, and uh, they had ninety thousand dollars in it on January first. Oh, that's great! Yeah, that's it amazing. was just like, and they paid themselves bonuses out. Now we're not full profit first with them yet. We have a lot of things we're working on. I probably need to press that. But if I give them another thing to do, they're probably going to explode. 
So, <laughs> but they had that ninety thousand dollars, and this isn't that's not a huge company. It's a moderately sized company. It was a significant savings account. So that that one percent idea, and don't overthink it. I, I tell people I'm a big fan of of the book, and I want people to read the book because it talks about the psychology. Uh, and behavioral. This is what you're going mm-hmm. to do, no matter what you think. This is how you behave. The reasons it works, which are magnificent, but you could really almost not read. Most of the book is is explaining that the actual process is pretty simple, right? And if nothing else, create a tax account, create a profit account, and then go uh, put everything in operating. And you might also Michael's uh, approach. Uh, yeah. The reason he names it profit first is because of conventional calculation of profit. We haven't said that. Uh, what 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 he means by profit first? You want to explain that? Yeah, the profit first in terms of the definition of profit, or well, why the you do profit once first? subtracting yeah. expenses first, or subtracting profit yeah. first. Okay, yeah. So so yeah, the typical that we all learn in school is sales minus. Uh, minus expenses equals profit. So you're, you're working on your expenses all the time. And that's the, the primacy effect. What you, what you think about first is what gets all the attention. So your expenses get money. And, and I definitely fell into that, even though I put projections down to make this money, it, it, it was too far. It was too distant because it was, it wasn't in my day to day. And if you put sales minus, you flip the formula to where sales minus profit, putting the profit first, and you take that out, and then the expenses are there. It's it's what's there. The profit is first. It goes away, and you make it work. You make right. the expenses work because we get busy in our business. And I t- this happened to me last week going to Mike's uh, profit first thing. I, I was looking – in a rental car. It was $740 because there are no rental cars. <laughs> right. I didn't have it left in my expense account. You know, so normally what I would have done is like, well, I just got to get it done. So I would have done it. Well, I saw, well, heck, I got a week left. I'm not going to make it <laughs> with that. I mean, it's just $740, but I've got each company separated now. So, so I don't, I make each one profitable is my, my goal. Uh, I didn't rent the car. I ended up getting a ride Get with Uber. some other guys from Phoenix yeah. to there. I gave them a hundred bucks. And but you could have, you could have always psychology. done that. I was actually thinking about you. <laughs> it's what? I say you could have always done that, but it was looking and seeing yeah. what was budgeted caused you to take action that saved you 650 bucks or whatever it was. Right. And it was so funny that, that we had these small plates, that small plate principle, because I would not have known that if I didn't have a separate separate operating expense where everything else was already taken out because there was plenty of money over there. I also have a drip account. I mean, there was, you know, 10, 10 times my operating expense sitting in my drip account, but my brain what, what is a didn't drip account? think about, I just need to transfer it. A drip account is when we talked about the revenue up there, if you get paid like a, a lot of my, my pay is quarterly. And then as a builder projects, things so right now I'm in a quarterly situation. So my drip account is a quarterly drip account where every, when I get paid that check, I take two thirds of it and I put it in the drip account. So it's not in my revenue account to distribute to those. So I wait until 30 days later And I, by the way, I hide it on my phone so I don't see it. (laughs) So, and then uh, 30 days later, I will take half of it and put there, which would be one third of that check. And then the next month, then I'll put it in there. Oh, so you're allocating over time. Those plates smaller. Yeah. And that's really valuable for contractors. If they uh, get paid in advance, you may have, uh, you know, deposit uh, account. I, I know I had one client, it wasn't actually construction, but she sold things all up front. And so she had an enormous amount of money that wasn't really hers because they had pre-bought these packages. And so putting that into a drip account and there's hundreds of thousands of dollars just sitting there. So then when the clients come in over the next six months, then, then she run out of money, but not if they, 
take that out of the drip account. It can right. be by time. Sometimes they're just real uneven. So you may actually have to create a spreadsheet to do that because it may just be dramatically uneven. That's where the advanced profit first comes. So we're not saying don't ever use a spreadsheet. Don't use a spreadsheet instead of separating in your bank account. Right. You can use a spreadsheet to decide how much is going to go into those accounts, but actually separate it in the bank account. Because I've had that argument a lot. Well, Mike said, don't use a spreadsheet. He said, don't uninstall Excel. You know, <laughs> just don't use the, that's a confusion I hear a lot is don't use it instead of your bank accounts. Right. Well, yeah, people who are addicted to but spreadsheets that, that, are. That scarcity mentality, the, the, I didn't hear you, sorry. I say people who are addicted to spreadsheets are addicted to spreadsheets and and I am one of them, but it's kind of cathartic. I can just sit there and do that. <laughs> right. I, I, I promise a lot of our listeners are yeah. not, but uh, we, we don't need to right. force spreadsheets, keeping it simple. Uh, you have several times mentioned small plate. Yeah. Would you expand on that, what you mean by that and why it matters? Yeah, that that is, to me, there, there are a lot of different Actually, I, I wrote them down. Mike has them really memorized because he does all these courses. I kind of have to write them down, you know. But the small plate is the um, the scarcity. Parkinson's law says that whatever is there, you're going to use it. So if you have, we like to convert that to time. If you've got three months to do a job, you're probably going to take three months to do that. Right. And if you have the same job, if you have 15 days to do it, you're probably going to do it in 15 days. And if you have $10,000 to do it, there's one way to do that. And if you've got 5,000, you're going to do it for 5,000. And so that's converted back to your bank accounts. If you've got $40,000 sitting in there, you're going to use up that $40,000 like my rental car. I would have used that. I would have gotten that rental car and just, things just sneak in. So the smaller the plate is, it comes from a diet concept. And I did this at my house. I went from bigger plates to smaller plates. I lost 20 pounds over, over <laughs> Christmas. And, and I put them on little bitty dishes, little bitty plates all the time, because if I serve it on a big plate, I'm going to eat all that food because it's there. And I don't feel that hunger for a while. So that's where Mike got the idea of the small plates. So in our bank account, you see smaller plates and you don't see $40,000 there right. when you only I have a, uh, of it. It's that mental process. I have an article I wrote some months ago called 23 hours and 55 minutes. And I ride a bicycle <laughs> and I was doing a thing in Colorado. I wanted to lose 10 pounds. So I was pretty, pretty disciplined every day on the intake for 23 hours and 55 minutes. And then five yeah. minutes before I went to bed, I'd hammer home about 2000 calories <laughs> and just blow right. the whole thing. And you're so, you're so right. I, I can, I have a man's face in, in mind when that money's sitting there, this is electrical contractor. When that money's sitting there, man, he's, he's disciplined. He knows he's going to have to spend it. He knows not all of it's his part of it's uh, deposits and he hasn't paid his material bill, but, there's hundred thousand dollars sitting there and you drive by that lot with those new F one fifties out there. And he just decided, and one day he literally drove up to my office and I just about, we about got in a fist fight. He said, I told you. <laughs> and he bought a new truck. Right. And, well, I need, he had all the reasons, you know, which were rationalizations. He didn't need that right. truck. And if he hears this, he'll probably come down here and take a swing at me. I'm not saying his name, but no, I love the guy, but <laughs> right. we're just livid. And it's exactly that. It was there. He was strong, but for however long it took to buy that truck, he wasn't. And now he's, now he's blown it. He can't get the money back out of that truck. Yeah, it, it, it's amazing. We get busy and my thought process, I've done this over and over again, even though I had all my spreadsheets and I say, well, I'm busy. This is here. I'm just going to spend it. I'm going to buy this saw. I'm going to figure it out later. So we do it. Right. And we're going to figure it out later. If it's not there, then the it's a simple process to change, to transfer that money in the bank, but we just don't do it. We don't, we, it disciplines us. It, I didn't really believe it until I did it to myself and having those separate accounts, that mental transfer 
of transferring that money is a big jump because then you have to think about how you're going to work that out. So it forces you to think that rather than taking the easy route and just delaying right. your decision of how to figure this out. I need this $40,000. It's me. It's I have to, you know, <laughs> you feel like you have to do it. But like I said earlier, if you don't think and you do those allocations, because I think I have all these bills because they're my regular bills and, I figure it out when it's not there and right. I, and I make it work. Well, that's the, um, I've been using actually before profit first, but I have three accounts. I have a tax account an operating account and it's not labeled as such, but basically it's a savings account and the savings account can never go down unless I'm buying assets. And since I'm, I'm a small business, I'm my own coaching business. Assets mean personal things as buying a condo or a, not and a truck's not an asset, right? Right. It is not an. Right. It, technically, it is an asset, but it's it an asset to me is something that it's going to preserve or increase. And it is funny because I can look. I have several banks, but I can look at at this one bank that has those three accounts in it, and I cannot. And I think in all the years I've done it, I've never done it, re taken money out of that account and put it back in operating. He, That's great. You just find a way. And sometimes that way is call somebody up and say, I can't pay you till after the first, but never take. And it's no, nobody has authority over me, yeah. but I cannot take money out of that account. It just kills me. Right. And, and it gives you, you know, that the, gets back to what you said earlier. The, the, what you said earlier about how do you start this? See, you started it off right. You eased into it. But what most people do is they get too aggressive with this. And once they've taken it out, the fact that you just said you've never taken it out, you know, once you take it out, the, the dam is burst to get back in that mental set. Right. Well, it's, yeah. it's, uh, so, it's a magnificent system. And, and just for everybody listening, I'm wanting to re kind of recap how to, how to do this. What, how would, how would you start? If you're talking to somebody who's not your client sitting in the room, somebody listening, what's your advice to, get started on this the the first step let's we'll go back to the book and and you know we, we actually really have like i you know have a sheet here you know that that tells us the textbook way to start and it is to open a bank account and that's the first thing we go open the, at least one maybe all five of the bank accounts and start putting that one percent and then you you should get an assessment done. It's, they have the assessment blocks in the book, or you can contact a profit first professional to do that for you. And the assessment is taking your income statement and your balance sheet and your cash flow statement. If you can get them to do that, <laughs> if they have one. people don't know what the heck we've asked for. And so we don't necessarily get it, but you get those. And then you determine your first shot at your numbers. And, and so when you put that in there, that's your target. You, you put your first shot from your numbers, but you also look at your real revenue, which we talked about that earlier with contractors. You're typically going to be taking out the materials and the subs. Some, some are not, I mean, if some like, like an electrician, that's part of his job. So each one's different, whether you take it out, that's your real revenue. And then you look at the table and you can get a profit first professional to help you. His benchmark system is just, amazing the way that those numbers work across industries everything that you put those targets in there so how much you should be going toward uh eventually um but so you have that and, and maybe you roll it out over one to two years you know we we call that a rollout plan and so you you've got it in each quarter you look again to see where your targets are what can you do to make those better can you change these targets where'd you end up can you make them a little bit more aggressive uh so open the bank accounts do your asset allocation uh assessment uh start funding those on your rhythm so your 10th and 25th is what the book says but pick it Probably start when you're picking your dates, probably start by when you get paid because you want it right after you get paid or, or you're going to 
you're not going to follow the system. <laughs> you know, Do you so take income you the, accounts to zero or you leave a hundred dollars in there or something? So every, all the money goes the, into this account. Most you, people don't take it to zero, but I mean, it says take it to zero in the book, but you try to find a bank that does not charge you if it goes to zero, but there are a lot of banks that'll charge right. you. So I find most people sort of rounding it yeah, uh, just and not close. taking it to zero. I would take it to zero, but I just kind of, my bank doesn't charge me, but I just get nervous being down at zero. So if it says, you know, $1,047, I'm probably going to take 1000 and leave right. 47 in there. But a lot of people have rules based on what their bank is uh, and, and what their setup is. Well, that's uh, one of, that falls into that category of overthinking. You say, I don't care. <laughs> leave a thousand dollars. If it's, if you're a hundred thousand dollars every two weeks yeah. in revenue, leave a thousand, whatever. Don't overthink it. Just make sure you're allocating and yeah. get started. And then you can make adjustments yeah. the, the, the to your good, percentages. The The good thing about this, this is not a double entry bookkeeping system. It took me right. years to figure this out. I mean, I was down to the penny and I was reconciling it and make sure it came out. My had all the totals down and make sure I made no mistakes. This is, this is hand grenades. You know, <laughs> these are, that may be too broad, but you, you don't, need it to be exact you want it to be close right i think that's because uh, don't, if you're spending that much time to get it to the penny you need to be spending that time in your accounting system right you probably i, I think that, that's what afflicted the client way. who texted me last night about driving her crazy i'll talk to her said, make allocations at the level that don't drive you crazy right i mean right it doesn't have to be yeah. 1.27564 just Put 1% over there. Put 3% over there. Yeah. Just as just so long as you're doing I mean, it. These are and your then budgets. should grow into it. Right. And and maybe there's something psychologically, if you're real, if, if you're too loosey-goosey with it, then maybe you'll be loosey-goosey on feeling like you have to stick to it. Right. That's the only negative side Do I, that I feel like telling people you don't have to be exactly like they may not take it seriously enough. But for the most part, I haven't really seen that happen just allocate close, you know, have a zero on the end of every number is okay. You know, right. yes, you're, you're close. Well, we, uh, you mentioned the assessment, uh, and we really haven't plugged the book very much. <clears throat> the book is by Mike McCallowitz and the title is profit first. And he has, uh, in there an assessment you can do that tells you where you stand. And then he has some suggested yep. percentages to allocate, to move forward. And then the benchmarks he mm -hmm. has, if you're a concrete a con construction company, you will have some benchmarks in there. How much out of a hundred dollars of sales, how much ought to wind up at the bottom line, like $15 out of a hundred or $12 or $7, which give you a little bit of an idea of where you rank and they give you targets to work for, uh, to, to aim right. for. So really a great place to start is buy the book. Yeah, it is. And these are not average numbers. These are the numbers that I, I think, I think Mike says it's the top 17% because you don't want to strive to be average. Right. The average okay. person goes out of business every five In years. the benchmarks. You mean. So you don't want to yeah. be that. Yeah, the benchmarks. Yeah. And we were really big into the home builders benchmarks. We helped well, we, I wasn't even born yet, but the, back when dad was doing it, we worked with the home builders association to come up with those chart of accounts and the benchmarks. And we spent a lot of time working on those. And this was so great. Then I had a lot of different businesses. So I was like, how do I get benchmarks for these other businesses? But when you take the real revenue, I'm just amazed at how close that comes to so many different businesses. I took this to our development company, which I said, Oh, it's a development company. It's not going to follow the numbers. And it's we had a different. fantastic yeah. year last year. So I put them in there. And after I took the things out and did everything where it should be, we were within 2% of every number on there. I was like, Oh my God, I can't believe this work. Cause I knew it was a very successful year. It was where it should be. And I mean, we were so close to lined up with Mike's numbers in a development company, I just thought, surely that won't work. But everybody says that I'm different. My business is different. You know, there, 
they're right when they say their businesses are different, but they're also the same. Uh, there are the individual things about a business that make it different, but they all have to have leadership. They have to have goals. They have to have marketing and sales. They have to have production. They have to have administration, insurance, all those things that make them the same. And that's also true of the activities in business. There's a lot of difference between the things that businesses do. Some work for them and some work against them. And, and I think one of the things I've found, and maybe you'll, you'll address this, is that a lot of times the activity that generates the most sales generates the least margins. And people kind of know that, but they're reluctant to let them go because they represent the highest sales number and they look at those sales and are afraid to let them go. Right. Well, well when you look at that, one of the, we didn't talk about this yet, but one of the major, most profitable parts of the advanced profit first is analyzing your sales. So if you're, if you have some segments of your business and analyzing your different offerings and they're not close to the benchmarks, well, maybe you don't need to be selling very much of that. Maybe you need to gradually make a transition to something else. I had a contractor the other day. Um, he's not a client, but we were talking. What was his business? It was, it was something, but I remember it was very, um, it was, it was very commoditized and he didn't have much, leverage in changing his prices and oh i know i was talking to another profit first professional that wasn't in the construction business so she had called me and we were talking about him and i was like he needs to look at diversifying out what his offerings are don't just be stuck right there look at another business and that's where we make the biggest difference i i was going to make that point um when i was thinking about what we would sell for me i'm not an accountant and when you do profit first, a lot of the bookkeepers, that's their program and they're done. You know, you get the accounts and you get them established and their program ends. To me, that's where we start. You know, so my program starts making profits once we get the accounts in there and then we help them to actually change those numbers. Just like that profit first person didn't know anything about construction. So she didn't know how to get him to change what he was doing. And, and that's the advantage of our group. Being this mastery, you can have a profit first professional that doesn't know anything about trim carpentry or something. And then we can give her some answers on how to solve some of these problems because they were stuck, which she didn't think, well, maybe they're different types of jobs. You know, you talk about different types of jobs. That goes back to what I was saying a little bit earlier. The things that people sell the most of oftentimes don't uh, contribute the most margin by any by any sense, but they hang on to it because it's sales. It reminds me that I wrote a, I had a, a, a client a number of years ago, and I wrote an article about it, so I remember the precise numbers. But he'd been growing for about four years and was up into the millions of dollars, and really thrilled and talking about that. But he wasn't making any money, or at least not enough to justify his effort and in investment. So what we did was we analyzed. The things that he did in his uh, there was one activity that consumed a lot of his resources his time his people his available equipment and really wasn't making him much money so it took a little convincing but we quit we talked him into quit doing that he just dropped that service completely and we reduced his sales by 34 percent and his net profit went up 808 percent by the simple move of stopping what was not profitable and consuming all his resources. Yeah. We've heard that over and over this year with the profit first groups. It's just the story after story of, Oh, well, my revenue is down, but I had the most profitable year ever. So we just over and over again, I, I can think of that example. I think about my, my component factory. We, we were taking the wall panels. I was trying to get every bit of revenue in there. I remember, we decided to put the windows in the wall panels. So we're getting extra revenue. You know how many windows we broke? <laughs> I mean, it, it was unbelievable. That was, yeah, we had more revenue. So our line and we were automatically just multiplying that revenue, the assumption that we were going to make this margin, but no way, you know, and, and, and it was, 
it was just a farce, even though we were doing lean manufacturing and should have figured it out, but we still had that sales, sales, sales. And actually the lean manufacturing would convince us that we were smart enough to make that 10 times improvement. But, but we just kept getting into different things. And if we had stayed maybe in our lane, we, we may have been a lot more profitable. Rob, we're coming up on an hour here and your time is valuable. And your, uh, your experience has just shown through, not just as a profit first expert, but as a, uh, as somebody who's been in business, I love the story about putting the windows in and the lesson about staying in your lane. Oh, this has been, been fun. I love talking about it. If people want to get a hold of you, uh, how can they do that? Well, uh, IronGate ESS, that stands for Entrepreneurial Support Systems, IronGateESS.com. I am Rob Williams at IronGateESS.com. Uh, the phone number here is 901-860-4252. Too, but I don't know if we need to tell people phone numbers anymore. So <laughs> it's just the, the web page. They can the, also, we have the contractor success forum.com. That is our web page for our, our podcast. It's really about bonded contractors. That's the main focus on there. So it's, it's another plug for that. <laughs> but I really appreciate you having me on. Thanks for listening to The Cash Flow Contractor. Check out our website in the show notes or visit thecashflowcontractor.com.